King Go In For Charity Easter edition. I'm your host, Calum Leslie, and with me, TJ Azuma QT Sanders. Yeah, I got it all out there. And we're getting ready for our third game, which is going to be Height versus Frazar. We just saw our second game, Dog, defeating Ecop 3 to 1. Of course, we saw Jab winning 3 0 over Number Guy in our very first game. So we are on to our third match of the day. We're into the second half of the games we're going to cast today, TJ. It's uh, it's been some. We've seen some really interesting games so far, and that last match with uh, Ecop and Dog really, I think, spoke to the the levels of strategy required for winning in Conquest. Mm -hmm. It also uh, gave us a really great showcase of the decks that I think are really strong right now in the current meta. Um, and it's it's changed quite a bit since since Blackrock Mountain. A lot of players were speculating that Blackrock Mountain actually wouldn't change the meta that much because. Uh, the dragon cards, while they're great, they don't have that much of an impact. Um, aside from Paladin, players are saying, oh, well, Paladin's going to get stronger, but every other class is going to stay about the same. But the effect that the cards like Emperor Thorsan have on uh, slower, combo-oriented, controly type decks like Oil Rogue, Freeze Mage, Midrange Druid, is actually pretty huge. We saw what kind of combinations Freeze Mage can pull off, where Dog, on curve, went like Thorsan, Alexstrasza, Pyroblast into a turn 10 kill as a freeze mage. Things like that wouldn't have been possible without a Thor sense, so that it makes that deck stronger. Also, Oil Rogue. We saw how strong that card is in Oil Rogue that Dog made made popular, or that Dog uh, showed us why it's popular. And of course, Imp Gang Boss and Zoo uh, makes that deck quite a bit stronger as well. The buff to Bane of Doom, the buff to Bane of Doom, um, also why that deck's strong. So, uh, Dog just showcasing the, the stronger decks right now in this tournament. And I think we're going to be seeing more decks that he brought uh, from the rest of the players as well. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that if you think about the, the place where Zoo was even just a couple of months ago, Zoo was really, really unfavored in competitive map play. It wasn't considered strong at all. It had really fallen by the wayside in a lot of senses. And now just as one card comes in and the archetype's completely viable again. And uh, it makes me think back to conversation i had with a life coach on kpl insight of course if you're a fan of the kingman pro league you can catch me on kpl insight every week uh, i believe we'll be doing one earlier in the week next week to make up for not doing one today but it's usually every friday 6 30 cet bring you the highlights of the week's games and then some interviews with players um i had the privilege of spending half an hour talking to life coach which uh was an education frankly in hearthstone he's a uh, wise man I've never not spoken to that guy and learned something. And, and what he was talking about, how he makes his adjustments week to week based on the percentage changes that he gets from just one new card. He was saying, you know, if I put one card in the deck, I probably draw it 50% of my games. And then if that affects my win rate by 2% and 50% of my matchups, that's a, that's a huge swing, even just from changing one card, making that micro change. And I think the, the position of Zoo now shows how finely balanced the classes are and how just that one extra card can make such a difference um, in the kind of vein that Life Coach said, that suddenly this is a, a deck which we've seen two players bring so far. Uh, we didn't actually get to see Number Guy's Warlock, so we don't know what it was, but we know Jab was running a, a variation on the theme as well. Yeah, that's, it's very true. And uh, cards like Bane of Doom, which, um, I mean, the change was pretty big because it allowed you to get cards like Malganis and Jaraxxus from, from Bane of Doom, which is pretty ridiculous, but nobody ever even thought about running that card. It was considered even not that great of a card in Arena, which a lot of times the, the standard is a little bit lower because you're choosing from three instead of choosing from a hundred um, or hundreds. Uh, so it's just small little changes like that really shape the meta. And cards like Emperor Thorson is a card that single-handedly one legendary changed quite a bit how the meta works similar to to what Lothab did there was a lot of old just combo decks say, yeah. that uh that Lothab just completely uh, shut out or gave like Miracle Rogue it gave classes some classes that would have near impossible matchups against Miracle Rogue it gave them a little bit of extra room because they a gadget game would come down if they didn't have a way to deal with it they could play Lothab and then have a way, way to deal with it the following turn so bought people extra turns so it's pretty cool. I'm still looking for uses for what the new legendary Ren Blackhand, uh, the 8-4 that destroys a legendary minion. It's a, it's a hard counter to Emperor Thorson. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's, uh, you play Emperor Thorson on turn 6, you just Ren Blackhand on, on turn 7. Re purpose found. There mm -hmm. you go. But uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, as, as you said, like the small 
changes in, in the the meta with Blackhawk Mountain, they're not uh, apart from Thoris and the most hugely impactful cards. I don't think they would have as much of an effect if Hearthstone wasn't at the point that it was at right now, where all the classes are so finely balanced, and there's not like we saw maybe even around BlizzCon time last year, where it was well, you have to bring. Really, it's kind of un, uh, unheard of if you don't bring Druid Warlock Hunter. Like, as you're, you're bringing four decks for that at that point, because it was last year standing with a ban. So you would bring Druid Warlock Hunter and then one other of your choice. Was pretty much how it worked yeah. for a long time. Um, and that was kind of, an, uh, you know, not a great place for Hearthstone to be. Now, you can see people bringing things like, like Shaman. You can see uh, Mage becoming super strong things like priest even in things like conquest because you only have to get one win they can be really relevant and uh, this new format along with the way the game balance has worked out really feels like hearthstone's in a great spot right now yeah that's that's definitely true and you look across all regions we talked about a little bit earlier but um people will say well shaman and priest are pretty uh, underrepresented underrepresented in uh north america and europe but in asia those classes are actually uh, people love those. Uh, the the Chinese priest w is really popular with the Velen's Chosen with uh, Death Lords. Uh, Shaman um, for uh, Taiwanese players is is really huge. Uh, players like Roger and Tom are two guys that uh, really make those decks popular. So you look across all the regions, different decks are popular. You look at it as a whole, um, and you're right it's a pretty pretty balanced experience right now um all right so we're just getting these players set up now for this matchup and uh we're stalling a little bit because it's taking a little while to get these guys ready but we can actually talk about the matchup itself and talk about hyped and fraser now you know hyped very well tj you've cast it with him you've had a chance to talk to him about the game quite a lot he's a guy who hasn't necessarily uh achieved as much i guess you would say in in terms of tournament wins but has been doing very well is a stalwart of temple storm very, very strong player. Was the number one seed in the NA qualifiers for BlizzCon last year. Rough story and, uh, there. Yeah, the, didn't didn't go so well for him running into Firebat, the eventual winner, very, very early on. But uh, a very, very strong player and someone who shouldn't be taken lightly at all. Yeah, there was that uh, at the North American BlizzCon qualifiers um, last season, last year, uh, like you said, Hyped and Firebat met in one of the first rounds. And I said, going into that matchup, I said, uh, the winner of this match early on in the North American qualifier has a high likelihood of winning the whole thing. And it was true. Firebad eventually did win the whole thing. And the way that Hyped actually went out was he got 3 0 by Zoo, by Firebat. It's the whole series of a series that I said has a huge, will have a high impact. And I think who even wins the whole thing um, lasted like 12 minutes. The whole series lasted about 12 minutes. So um, Hyped, I, I still think he's one of the strongest players. Um, I always look at any player that when I'm watching them, uh, they make a play that makes absolutely no sense and then win <laughs> the game. Those are the players that are the ones to watch because they're thinking on a whole nother level as everybody else that they're making plays that you look at it on the surface and you say, oh, that play doesn't make sense. There was obviously a better play. Uh, they're just thinking three, four, five, six turns ahead. And eventually they end up do winning the game because they saw – a play that increased their chances of winning that not many other players would have, would have seen. And uh, Hyped is a guy that, that really does that. When he casts, sometimes people criticize uh, what he's saying because he says, oh, I think this is the best play. And everybody's like, what the? Like, that's obviously not the best play. Like, this play gives you so much more value right now on this turn. And Hyped's like, oh, no, no. If you do this, then five turns from now. You've won the game. You've won Easy. the game. Yeah. Easy. Why didn't you see that? Oh, because so, we're not as good as you. It's players like that that, that really... Uh, Orange is a, is a player like that as well. Um, I remember so many times at like Katowice or um, at uh, Seed Story Cup where the casters were like, what the heck is he doing? Like, that such a bad play. And then he went on to win the game and win the series. And he won those tournaments. Like, you, you can't argue with the results that he's having. Even though they seem yeah. like weird plays, it's just because you don't know his thought process. And I really think that's a cool thing. Well, talking about Fraser for a second, uh, he's a player who's currently on Team Fnatic. He's not a player you maybe heard of as much, but certainly earlier on, he, uh, into, in, back in 2014, he was doing very well in the European scene. He's uh, widely regarded as a pretty good player. There's a kind of there's a playing group of the like the Dignitas guys, the Fnatic guys, the kind of Euro those European pros. They all practice together. They all share tech together. I know that that's a group of players who are working harder now than they've ever worked before. 
those players are really, really working hard to stay relevant in a what is a global game now and really elevate themselves. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how those players can can really take take it forward in 2015. Did get quarter final in the DreamHack Summer Tournament as well, and is uh, is in the KPL, not doing as well in the KPL as he would like. Has finally picked up his win now, so maybe he's hitting his stride, hitting a bit of form. And uh, yeah, this is another of the really interesting matchups we've got today. Yeah, and I I think Frezar is sort of in the same boat as hyped where, <clears throat> excuse me, he's he's had a lot of close uh, tournament achievements. Like he he has he hasn't won anything big. Neither of these players have won anything big, but they've both been very very close. Um, both uh, like one or two matches away from qualifying for the top sixteen for BlizzCon last year. Um, both with a couple like top eight finishes at relatively large tournaments. Uh, but both players never, not with that breakout performance, and they're both w relatively well known. I mean, Templestorm, of course, is is one of the teams that people watch just because of, of Raynad and uh, Fnatic is a huge organization that's been around for a very long time. Called in Fraser. How did you say, Fraser? Fraser. Like Fraser. Fraser. Television show. I don't know. I'm just trying to say it like Caldi says it. I can never tell what's him pronouncing it right and what's Caldi's accent. Sorry, Caldi. I love you, but it's really hard to tell. <laughs> Cod is, is like a step ahead as far as pronunciation goes. I was talking about the it's players true. that are step ahead in Hearthstone. That's how Caldi is, but with the pronunciation of, of names. It doesn't. You, you look at it at first, you say it doesn't make sense on the surface, but it's just because Caldi's thinking five, six steps ahead of the way people are going to pronounce words. Well, while we're uh, just getting into this matchup and getting the final few things worked out, let's talk a little bit about our next matchup, which is going to be our final game of the day. It's the fourth game in the opening round of the tournament. It's going to be Chucky versus Ekta. Now, Chucky coming in as a replacement for Trump at pretty last minute, but he's on Team Dignitas now. Chucky, one of the uh, the true journeymen of Hearthstone at this point, has been on so many different teams. I think it's four now, Mana Grind, Clarity, Coast... Mm -hmm. and now uh, finding a home of Team Dignitas. Yep. Uh, not a huge surprise that he signed for Team Dignitas. He and Blackout in particular are uh, very good friends and they practice together a lot. Partners Hunter in crime. Partners in crime was is a pretty apt description of uh, of Blackout and Chucky. But he's going to be playing Ekta and uh, Ekta from Punchline Esports Club, as you said, one of the players who maybe haven't heard of. And while this is an invitational, there are some great opportunities being given to players who maybe haven't achieved as much in their career so far, or you may have not really even heard of. Um, and I did actually get the chance to uh, to speak to Ekta early in the week to find out a little bit about him, just to, because that is our job as casters at the end, is to give you guys, uh, at the end of the day, is to give you guys information and augment the presentation in that regard. Um, so he ha does have some achievements to his name. He was in the uh, the Millennium Stream Fighters tournament, which is a, a French-run tournament, but he, uh, won that tournament against Neyman in the final. Um, he he taught, was telling me about a tournament called the Championnat Francophone, if I can pronounce that correctly. That's the uh, that's kind of a, a French national tournament where the best French players are, and they're currently in a group phase where he's uh, top of his group, so he's doing pretty well. He's a, a, a strong warrior player. Warrior's his favorite deck. Gromash <sighs> is his favorite card. Man after my so, own heart. I mean, I, I'm a big Control Warrior fan as well. Um, so maybe we'll get to see our first warrior of the tournament against Ekta. Um, Punchline, he says, you know, they're a group of hardworking players who maybe don't get as much recognition and they have a pretty hard time because they don't have the resources of bigger French teams like Millennium or Gamers Origin. But they're all trying really hard and they've got some great players and they're they're looking forward to this big opportunity. And that's, that's another thing he was saying to me is he's saying, look, you know, for some other players, maybe this is just another online invitational. But for, for me and, o and Oleg, this is a huge opportunity for us. This is the first time we've really had an opportunity on the international stage, and we're not about to let that pass us by. So uh, you're going to see some really determined players here from Ekta and Oliak, and they seem to have the definitely the right mentality going into this. And France has produced some pretty strong players. Uh, Maverick is another French player. He's not on the same team. Uh, is he new, isn't he from Belgium? Maverick? I thought he was French. He used to be. A, he used to play for Punchline. And Punchline is an yeah. exclusively French team. Is he Belgian? I don't think it's an exclusively French team. I don't know. That was not? Oh, well then. <laughs> it seemed like all the players were French when I looked at Punchline. Because um, they had strong ties with like Millennium, which was a French organization. I mean, Millennium yeah. is a French organization that does pick up non-French players. 
So that might be... <laughs> that could be what it is. So we're being shown some pretty dank memes here by our producer, so it's uh, to, to keep us entertained while we're... To keep us going while we're providing <laughs> you guys with some, uh, some dank commentary, you could say. You'll never believe us if we told you. I'm just trying to find out if Maverick's French at this point. This is my... Yeah, well, I look silly if he's not French, but I kind of... I thought he was... No, he's he's Belgian. Oh, he's Belgian. What well, then he might it? he might speak French then. Well, yeah. Olyk is Belgian, the guy that we're gonna be casting. Okay. So uh, he's Belgian. So it's my not exclusively a French team. My excuse here, I'm colorblind, so all the, those flags, <laughs> with the, the three stripes. I just Are you really colorblind? I am colorblind. Yeah, it's a fun Maybe... fact. Oh. I'm red green colorblind. You... I'm um, orange yellow colorblind. There's a lot of I. You'll notice that I wear a lot of very neutral colors. It's because so when I walk out in public, I don't look ridiculous. Because if you think <laughs> you're wearing a green shirt, but you're actually wearing a red shirt, it's very embarrassing. Not that I would know, and not that anybody would point it out to me, but uh, it's really hard for me to tell part European flags, which is one of the biggest weaknesses of being colorblind. People always say, oh, hey, your clothes don't match. Oh, it's really hard for you to see like stoplights. Um, there's games that don't accommodate for colorblind mode stuff like that but no the hardest part is telling apart european flags because they all have the same design they're just different colors like italy and france who knows people who, who aren't knows? colorblind i, I, I guess knows. so yeah that's that's who knows that's a good point i can see uh we can see the players here actually uh while they're getting ready I can see fraser is uh fraser is ready to go he's got his uh, he's got his game face on we're just waiting for our hyped to, to get into position and get himself ready to go here. We're sorry about this uh, slightly lengthier <laughs> delay between matchups than we would have liked. It is not of our doing. Um, sometimes, you know, in live tournaments, it sometimes takes a little while when your players don't know exactly when they're going to be playing and getting them into position and getting all set up on the drop of a dime is not the easiest thing. So uh, I'm just saying, lay off Twitch chat. Lay off. We're trying our best here. <laughs> well, I mean... We... It's almost getting to the point where these players have been we've been waiting so long for the players that I'm gonna have to start role playing as as an actual control warrior. <laughs> I have a Grom's Grom Hellscreen costume actually in my closet, right back there. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, doesn't wouldn't surprise many people if you know me well. <laughs> but, I thought you were gonna say you're gonna start role playing as the players. Um, I could do that I as know. well. I you spent do. some time around hyped. Uh, do you have a good hyped impression? Yeah. That's it right there. <laughs> That's it. That's your whole impression. That's my hyped impression. After spending a lot of time with hyped um, in person, that's my greatest George, George hyped Magazzini impression right there. He'd be really proud of me for, for doing that. Well, that's good. Uh, I was going to ask if you could, do, if you had any Frodan impressions. I know Frodan is the king of impressions. No. I don't know anyone that does a good Frodan though. Frodan's, um, Frodan's a man of many faces. <laughs> he's he's really hard to to emulate. There's reason why Frodan is head and shoulders above the rest of mankind, as far as his his quality of 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 everything about him, of all his features. Often imitated, but never bettered. Exactly, exactly. That's his unofficial slogan. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me. He told me that once. Yeah. Didn't really... Yeah, that's actually that that name right there is often imitated. What was it? Often imitated, but never bettered. Never bettered. Yeah. Well, we were talking about earlier. That's chapter seven of the memoirs <laughs> of Raynad. Yeah, Raynad's, we were talking about this. Uh, Raynad's self-written autobiography. We were talking about this. The uh, you were telling me about Raynad's autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, autobiography being self-written is kind of a, that's. Uh, it's kind redundant. of a given, but some people don't know. Uh, tell me, tell me a little bit yes. about the the memoirs of the Salt Man. Oh yeah, the the Raynad's autobiography, memoirs of the Salt King. Uh, chapter that's one, cool. I still don't know who Monk is. <laughs> chapter two, how Ecob shaped my life. Chapter three, the Red Light District. It's just a, it's a really fantastic That's a very long chapter. It's going to be a, it's a fantastic book. I can't wait for, for him to actually announce that. Chapter the Red, the Red Light District chapter, surely that get, that's a multiple chapter. Chapter uh, four. Chronicle. An evening in Yonkaping with, with hype. 
that's the one I'm I'm looking forward to the most. Chapter four, the strengths of a good cider. I can't believe I, 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 we we really exhausted our levels of uh, caster banter here. To be honest, I'm so glad I'm not reading Twitch chat right now, and it's on delay as well. But in about ten minutes, Twitch chat is going to be screaming at us. Chapter seven, why does that helicopter look so good? <laughs> oh. Chapter eight, while well, never put on text to speech again. Yeah. Or, as an alternative, Chapter 8, why text-to-speech is the greatest thing for Hearthstone streamers. All right, okay, I have some information. I have something else we can talk about. Thank God. We have classes for Hyped and Frazar here. Fantastic. So, uh, I said we might see our first warrior with Ekta. We're actually going to see it from Frazar. So we're going to see Rogue, Mage, and Druid for Hyped, and Hunter, Priest, and Warrior for Frazar. That's a very interesting lineup. Yeah, um, uh, I talked about it earlier. Um, Rogue Mage, I thought Rogue Mage Warlock was was really strong lineup. Uh, Rogue Mage Druid, I said you could sack, you could put in mid range Druid for uh, pretty much any of those classes and still have a strong lineup. I really like Hype's lineup. Uh, Frejar, of course, you, you said really weird Hunter Priest Warrior. Um, I'm trying to think of the strategy behind going with a. a <laughs> oh God. <laughs> We've just been okay. We just got unicorned. We just got unicorned. And being the people will even. This is this is just to make us look stupid in front of Twitch chat. This is the plan. Yeah. So hunter priest, hunter priest warrior. Um, two very slow decks, and one very fast deck. Um, it's it's hard to say what kind of strategy it is, but this 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 lineup can get heavily punished. That that Frejar is bringing. Uh, warrior, I actually think is is pretty strong right now because it does well against uh, a a majority of the classes that are popular. Control Warrior is actually super strong because it does really well against Freeze Mage. Um, it does really well against uh, Oil Rogue. Uh, it it has one of the best matchups against the current Zoo just because they have the Despite Warwind effect, which takes care of Imp, Imp Gang Boss really well. Um, it's really good against uh, Face Hunter as well. Yeah, fantastic against Face Hunter. The one weakness that it, that it does have is Druid. Which that's one of the reasons why I like Hype's lineup because he's sort of shoring up his poor matchups. The poor matchups that Rogue and Mage have, Druid has a really good matchup. So uh, he's sort of hitting hard with those two decks, and then has the Druid to sort of clean up what what doesn't get it. The the one weakness to that strategy is you, you're reliant on getting that matchup early on, and then you're reliant on being able to choose and and read your opponent well enough to get your good matchups later in the series. So uh, this should be really interesting. I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, Warrior can be really strong against those classes, but against things like Face Hunter and uh, even Mech Mage and things, it can really struggle uh, if it doesn't get the right cards early. But Warrior, Warrior is a deck where if it gets the right cards in the first couple of turns, uh, I mean, I know Firebat when, has talked about how basically it's about whether or not you draw Fiery War Axe uh, for turn two, uh, and if not, you lose. I don't think it, it's not quite as simple as that, but it, it can often come down to well, things like that. I, I, okay, so no mean to brag or anything but i probably have close to a thousand wins with control warrior uh on ladder um probably close to two thousand games total played i think i have like a 58 percent total win rate with control warrior <laughs> i was gonna um, say if you've got a thousand wins in two thousand games that's not a great win rate yeah my win rate is close to 60 percent. so it's pretty good but like not like oh my god amazing oh 70 percent win rate he's a god no no it's respectable is is the <laughs> And in against Zoo, if I know it's Zoo, I hard mulligan for Fire War X. Even oh, of course you do, yeah. If I see uh, Warlock on the ladder, you can't get greedy. You can't say, oh, well, here's a, here, here's a shield block shield slam that I have. Maybe I'll keep this in case it's a handlock. No, you hard mulligan for Fire War X. And I, feel, I, I felt like that's the my best chance of winning against Warlock in general, not knowing if it's handlock or Zoo. And so um, sometimes it can come down to that. Sometimes it can come down to if you didn't have Fire War Axe, if you don't have a play to make on turn two and turn three as a Warrior player, it's grim. It's really grim. All right. Well, we're getting into game number one of this series. It's going to be the Druid of Hyped versus the Warrior of Frizzer. And uh, this is going to be a pretty interesting matchup. This is going to be pretty much a favorite matchup for the Druid, uh, particularly if Hyped is running maybe the faster Druid. This could be a really good matchup for him. But uh, again, we talked about this in the first game, is if you can get an unfavored win, 
in Conquest, it really, really can help your tempo. So if Frazar was able to win here with the Warrior, this would really put him in a good position in the series. Yeah, this is the strongest uh, opening for Hive. Going with the Druid first, because I said, he really needs to get that good matchup first. He doesn't want his Freeze Mage to end up against that Warrior. So he's either going to try and give Frazar a win with the Warrior early on, or, well, I, this is assuming it's Freeze Mage, which it, it, there's a chance that it might not be. Um, just from experience watching Hyped, the couple of times that he's or brought Mage, the majority of the time it was Freeze Mage, and it, it feels like the strongest variation of Mage right now. Um, so he he wants to be able to probably save that Freeze Mage to last and hope that it doesn't get matched up against that Warrior, which is the biggest thing that he wants to avoid because that's the biggest mismatch that he has with Frejar's decks. Well, we can see a card that may well help uh, Frazar. That's... Uh, he does get the Fiery War Axe and does have a Kazan Mystic in his hand here as we get into wow. the game. Okay. It's not going to help him in this matchup, but it could well help him against the Mage. Kazan Mystic and Warrior is just like overkill. It's like beating a dead horse because you're already strong against Face Hunter and Freeze Mage, which are the two most popular variations of Secret Glasses right now. Because I'm missing, it's just sort of like, well, I've already beat you. Now let me take the secret as well. It's just another form of, of, of um, another advantage that you gain as a warrior player in those matchups. So it's pretty cool. Pretty funny. Interesting. It makes it, yeah, I mean, at this point, there's so many different tech choices you can put in your deck. It feels really interesting to put Kazan Mist again. Like you say, it's kind of it just increases your win rate against decks you're already strong against. It doesn't help you counteract decks that you may be weaker against. And I guess in Conquest, that's maybe kind of the way that Frazar has, has analyzed this, is that I just need to make sure that my Control Warrior can get a win against something like Major Hunter, and then I can win with my other classes, rather than trying to improve its overall matchups. Hype is like a better looking version of me. <laughs> um... That's the best way I can explain it. I mean, he does have much superior hair. He's like, if, if all my features were slightly upgraded, a, a slightly more pronounced chin, slightly more chiseled cheekbones, and better hair, that's me. It's basically me. I'm basically I Hype's spend, twin. I think, I think you enjoy spending time with him a little bit too much, TJ. Maybe. Let's concentrate on the game here. Uh, Fiery War X for Frazar, uh, of course, coming down early. And uh, nice wild growth for Hyped, getting the Shade and the Azure Drake out as well. Hyped, of course, starting the ramp of the Druid, which the Druid is, of course, known for, is the signature style of the Druid. Um, this is kind of a tough spot for Frazar. It's You'd almost think it was a, a snap death spite to kill the Azure Drake, but then you'd waste the, the Fiery War Axe, and that feels really bad. Yeah, but I think you have to do that here. The One of the main ways that Druid wins in this matchup, that Druid is considered favor, is because... All they have to do is put out a decent amount of pressure early. And then the warrior, oh, the early game removal is almost all using weapons to clear up the board. So they're gonna take damage. They're gonna take a lot of damage early on. A lot of times warriors in, against faster decks, they get really low before they get to that stabilization point. And you can't afford to do that against the druid because on turn nine, you always have to be playing around the combo. And with Emperor Thorsen, if that comes out, then all of a sudden on turn seven, you all of a sudden have to be worried about the combo. So that's why this matchup can be pretty tough for the Warrior player. Looks like he's looking at the coin here, probably for, yeah, he's going to go for the Thoris and just get that out as early as possible to get the reduction on the cards. A four mana Sludge Belcher, a five mana Shield Maiden, two mana BGH, and it's good that he has that BGH in hand because he could be about to see a Doctor Boom come down from Hyped. Feels kind of uh, it feels bad to have it on turn seven and not play it really. You feel like that's a misplay every time, pretty much. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of nicknames for Doctor Boom, Doctor Seven being one of them. Sometimes Druids, Doctor Five is a is a is a nickname Doctor Boom only has. Doctor Win, also, also a a suitable nickname. Uh, Doctor GG, I know that's Doctor GG. Doctor Balanced. Yep. Send us, uh, send us your nicknames for Dr. Boom on Twitter. Maybe you can send us those in to us. I'm just cycling here. This is really difficult, actually, because he does probably want to play the Dr. Boom, but he also really wants to kill that Thorison. Yeah, um, I actually like this play better uh, because this is sort of a mixture. Like you said, you want to clear the Thorison off, which is number one priority, I think. I think 
playing the Thorazan is number one, and then applying pressure is number two. Uh, so this way, he sort of gets the best of both worlds. He keeps the shade, in which case he would have had to remove the shade earlier, which shade actually provides more pressure, I think, than Dr. Boom in that situation, because it makes Force of Nature Savage War all of a sudden turn into a 21, 22, 23 damage combo. Um, but he still gets to, to, to cycle through his deck and clear off the Thor Sand. So I think this is the better play in that, in that type of situation because of the, that list of priorities that you have when faced yeah. with a member of Thor Sand. We talked about Hyped being a player that plays so many turns ahead, and he's going to be looking here, you know, he's got the Savage War in hand, has the Shade on board. If he were to draw into Force of Nature, like you say, he's got to be thinking about a huge combo turn with that with that uh, Shade of Naxxramas. And now he's in a little bit of a tough spot. He's got that Shade that he needs to deal with, the Sludge Battery needs to deal with somehow, and the only way he can really do that is using his Shade. It does have the Wrath to follow up, but this could be a little bit difficult. He could use the Wrath to cycle with the Hero Power, and they uh, drop the shredder after trading the uh, killing the sludge with the shade. With the shade, does he a huge amount of other players other than just maybe jamming Doctor Boom? But with that death spite up, those bombs are going to die straight away, and that feels that that does feel like you're throwing those bombs away a little bit, especially with an armor smith on board. It can be really difficult to get any value from those bombs. But he's going to yeah. go ahead with it. I like not throwing the shade in here um, because. Brawl would be pretty weak in this situation. That's the only reason why you would unleash the shade in that situation is if you're playing around Brawl. Uh, but, I mean, his creatures are pretty strong as well in this situation, so it, it wouldn't really help him that much. Um, and you've already left the, the shade stealth that long. You you want that to be a continuous threat uh, after turn 9. You want the warrior player to always be playing defensively in this matchup because you want to have, like, five, six turns in the row where you're constantly threatening... Force of Nature Savage Roar combo and oh. keeping that <laughs> yikes that's unfortunate <laughs> killing the armor smith he's going to go for the BGH rather than even using the death spite and execute I guess he's maybe thinking that uh, the whirlwind from the death spite and the execute could be really really useful later on but he's just going to put the shield maiden up and put himself up way above 30 health and there's the double savage roar fortunately he doesn't have Thoris of his own yet but uh, it's starting to look potentially scary later on for height with the combos but he's probably just going to try and get some minions on the board here. Does have that wrath he could use to maybe remove the the big the big game hunter. This is a really tough spot to be in um, because again, like I said, you're you're sort of all in on that shade now. You're sort of saying, well, I've I've kept it stealth this long. I should probably just keep it stealth. Um, but at the same time, you also have to think, well, okay, that shade is a three drop. So even though it's threatening, I still have to use it at some point. I can't get too far behind in the game and on the board uh, to um, lose myself a game that I should have otherwise won. So uh, I like trying to... You don't want to flood the board too much here because if you are going to keep your shades, your shades stealth, flooding the board is just asking to be brawled if that's the case, uh, which is never something that you want to do because if you're investing that much into your shades... Losing them to a brawl is probably the worst feeling and almost an auto loss. Um, but he's going to play quite a bit, so uh, this is sort of a balance, I guess. Yeah, he's going to build that board with a second shade, and at this point, the combo is looking pretty destructive. That sludge belcher is going to be a real pain, but uh, this is the kind of board where if you could get pick up an innervate and a force of nature, or even Thorison in the next turn, and just get those cheaper Savage Roars and Force of Natures. It's kind of disgusting that double Savage Roar and Force of Nature is possible within 10 mana thanks to Thorazin. Mm -hmm. Kind of the ultimate why why this card is a uh, really broken excuse, isn't it? Yeah. What's in the box? Okay. Archer Protector. It's not too bad. It's an average, average creature. I believe so, it's, too. it's average. Yeah, it's pretty average from the pilot shredder. It's not terrible for either side. It's uh, it's no novice engineer, which is objectively the worst card you can get from a pilot shredder. Oh, I don't know. Captain's parrot's pretty bad. Captain's parrot has beast synergy. Yeah, but novice engineer, you can bounce back with time rewinder and draw a card. Oh, uh, that's true. So, so maybe... how, how many times? I think you're more likely to have time rewinder as a spare part than you are to have anything that'll benefit from beast synergy well there's a tosh in the druid for hype and this is a card i've seen played with a little bit in druid 
Um, just because it is a good body, it's really sticky as well with that seven health. It's uh, it trades really well with a, a lot of minions, things like Shield Maidens, things like Thorison, uh, and those spare parts can be really useful as well to to cloak things. You could reveal your shade exactly, and then yeah. recloak it. Well, people uh, underestimate the power of spare parts. I think in general, like one of the reasons why Mech Mage was so strong because of spare parts. Uh, Archmage Antonidas stealth is almost an auto win if you have yeah, any much. sort of board presence. Just the same as like uh, a stealth Emperor Thorson is not an auto win, but almost close to it. Like if you have played like Toshley, then Emperor, and uh, are able to stealth it. So. Just ridiculous power plays that you can make. Even freeze right now, you can protect one yep. of your 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 minions with it. It's pretty big. Yeah, I mean, you can do quite. A, you can do a lot with this freeze. It's certainly it's uh, a very very useful spare part. That's why we're talking the pilot shredders. One of the one of the most annoying cards to come out pilot shredder is the patient assassin. <laughs> Argu arguably one of the very best that can come out. Yeah, that's that's true, and it is a one-one, so it's pretty funny. And you know, millhouse comes out, and if you've got four damage, you can deal with it. But patient assassin. You can't deal with it unless you got AoE. It's killing one of your creatures and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, Fraser's starting to run out of uh, decent threats here. It does have an Acolyte and I think he's possibly going to Cruel Taskmaster that just to see what he can draw. A little bit rough. Um, cool Taskmaster execute onto the Toxie would have been a pretty decent move. Uh, if he plays Shield Block here, he doesn't He'll have to run his, yeah, his because I'm missing again to be able to proc the execute on this. He's gonna go for the fiery war axe instead of eat the five damage, and that's getting potentially pretty dangerous when we can see what's in Hype's hand, mm -hmm. which is three pieces of the four card combo. Yeah, well, there's a lot of math involved, but force of nature might be lethal. It's not force of nature, unfortunately, it's ancient of lore. Still uh, second best card that he could have drawn, I think. Pretty much, though the the damage from the warrior is not too threatening, but it's something to definitely be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, got 13, 16 damage showing, so um Yeah. Shield slam face, shield block, shield slam face, that would be <sighs> yeah, that'd be that's pretty bad. A lot of damage, yeah. Well here's the Thorison. Can't do anything with it, unfortunately. It gets the second ancient of lore. Yikes. Okay, at this stage, I might um, trade in one of my shades um, because at 25 health, uh, he's still threatening lethal with uh, Force of Nature Savage or, or Force of Nature Double Savage or next turn easily. So I would sacrifice one of these. I would actually sacrifice the smaller one. Yeah, I think so. But he might want to just get rid of the Sludge Belcher entirely um, using both, both slimes or both shades, slimes. Get rid of the slime with his second shade in order to just open up opportunity for him to use double um, Force of Nature, double Savage Orb if he draws into it without being impeded by something small. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think another option is the Savage War to use his face to clear this up as well and be able to clear the Shield Maiden off. And that is taking a little bit of extra damage and taking that second Savage War up when you've got the second in hand already as well. Well, there's the Alex Straza. That could be really crucial here. Actually, if you put the Alex Straza down at this point and uh, onto your opponent's face, Big Game Hunter is in hand. That's going to be a pretty pretty solid response from Hyped. But uh, Drew is starting to feel a little bit pressured here. Sorry, solid response from uh, yeah, solid response from Hyped with the Big Game Hunter would be. He's going to draw some cards first. Gets a brawl. Alex Straza, though, just for the sake of using Alex Straza. If you don't have a second threat in your hand that's vulnerable to BGH or the combo in your hand, like a Gromash Cool Taskmaster, I don't like just playing Alex Straza for the sake of doing that, putting him at 15. Um, just because if you use Alex Straza now and it gets BGH'd, all of a sudden you gave up so much tempo by um, giving him control of the board and you have no way to, to finish him off. Um, and you're, you're, I guess it's the only time that he's going to be able to use it safely uh, because of the threat, but it's risky. It's risky stuff. And there it is. I mean, BGH um, and Keeper of the Grove even is just clears the board and gives him huge uh, uh, advantageous positioning here. You could even see BGH with the, uh, the Ancient of Lore. 
because that would really really push hypes a card advantage and just give him so many more options because he has that innovate that sh that uh, savage where he's looking for the force of nature bj uh, emperor i think if you're if you're going to not play keeper i think so many options there oh man and that is really what hyped has here i mean there aren't that many great options for Frazar. he has the death spite which he's holding on to a little bit has a shield block which i guess you can cycle but and the brawl is entirely useless at this point yeah so bgh pretty much has to come out here um, but he's debating on whether or not he wants to um ancient of lore or emperor i think in this turn or keeper and if he's going to use ancient lore this turn he's going to want to use it first it, just because it, it's unlikely that it changes his play but you always want to draw first just in case. Because there might be something that you overlooked. That's the pro level plays there. He's roping. He is. He's, yeah, so he's just going to play that BGH and then probably the Thorison. Um, oh, oh, he just gets it in in time for the rope there. That was pretty dangerous. Ooh. Oof. Yep. That was a tight one. And, and that... uh, we're going to see... Two mana Savage War. In that case, I might have even thought about actually bringing my BGH back. How good is that shield block? That shield slam pickup though. Shield block, shield slam onto the Thoris, and that shield slam top deck feels pretty huge. Yeah, definitely. And Fraser's looking at the death spike here. I don't know. I think you shield block first, like we said. You draw always draw cards first if you're going to. Uh, well, so I guess he, that means he's not going to. Well, if he's planning to attack, then you always want the armor to come second. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. If he's going to use the death spite to clear. Yeah. Uh, using the death spite to clear is pretty risky here because he has an easy clear, but he values creatures, uh, especially in this matchup. So, um, and yeah. he will play around in a weird way. Maybe not even think about it. He'll play around force of nature, double savage or because uh, he'll be at 23 health, which is one damage away from... I, I, w I wouldn't think he'd need to play around Double Savage Roar because we've seen one played. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's correct, yeah. Caster misplay. Yeah, for Zap sure. casters. Time Rank reminder. 25 casters. I thought Time Rewinder was Savage Roar. I can't even blame that on colorblindness. <laughs> what other excuse do I have? So, uh, since we don't have this, the Double Savage Roar play anymore, what do you think about Innervate Ancient of Lore Sylvanas? Hmm. I think he's just afraid of that he's going to die. He's, I guess he's afraid he won't. He's gonna, could be afraid he's going to die. And I mean, Gromash get, if Gromash gets picked up, he would die. Um, yeah, regardless of if he heals or not. That's what, that's exactly what I was going to say. He's got to be thinking about the maths here and thinking that even if that there's a Cruel Taskmaster or a Gromash in hand and he picks up one half of that combination, 12 plus the 4, it'd be 16. So it'd be exactly as much as he would have if he healed. If he heals and armors up and is able and decides to clear this 2-2, he'd stay alive at 1 health. Um, but he'd be he'd be pretty dead at that point. Yeah. And he wouldn't have any real way to deal with the Gromash. So I think drawing cards is really the smart option here. A lot of people might think about healing here, but thinking about your opponent's outs, I think drawing cards is definitely the right option. Yeah. Um... And Cruel Taskmaster Grom is still win, but nope, that is um, that is not that. It is an execute. It's a really tough spot for Fraser. He's so close to killing his opponent at 11 health. I say Gromash, I mean a Gromash top deck ends the game just there and then. Mm -hmm. At this point he can deal 4 damage, he can put himself up to uh, 25, put his opponent down to 7. He can even cool Taskmaster and execute this 5-5. Five, five. And he's going to have to do it. And, I mean, cool Taskmaster Grom still is a victory for him. But yep. he's, on a he's on a clock now because he you know that uh, Hype is going to try and use his hero power to armor up uh, every turn. So... Yeah, I mean, this is that's absolutely true. I mean, if this takes if it takes more than two turns for Gromash to come off the top, then it's no longer lethal, and that's that's pretty huge. So we're gonna see the Sylvanas and the Shredder here, which are uh, Shredder obviously a little bit brawl resistant. There's a little them. You get that slight moment of of anticipation as that card comes off the top. 
because once again, <laughs> Gromish is is lethal. I mean, here you sort of just have to throw out Lotheb and hope he doesn't have Force Nature. Well, no, because Lotheb would block it. Um, Savage War wouldn't be a win by itself. Savage War Hero Power still wouldn't be a win by itself. He's still relatively healthy. Uh, but Lotheb will buy him a turn. Uh, so Lotheb Armor Up, I think, is only option. You need that cool Taskmaster. You can't afford to throw that away because that's your only opportunity yeah. of winning right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's all he has really is an out. There's an Azure Drake. That's mm. not too bad. It's going to help him draw deeper into the deck. It's going to get another body because I say hyped. Uh, Fraser is definitely well above combo range at this point. So it's kind of tough to see hypes out. So he just needs to build up this board and really just outlast the warrior at this point. Oh, there's an ancient watcher off the sh off the shredder. That's one ah. of the worst. For druids, Does it have a silence. Yeah, sometimes druids can make use of it. There's a druid of the claw off the top again. So getting some good value minions now. Yeah, he's able to armor up as well, so that'll buy him an extra turn here. Um, well, it'll next turn it will buy him another turn because he'll be playing around Grumish Cool Taskmaster. Uh, this is a pretty good brawl turn though. Ragnaros, way too risky to play in this situation just because yeah. of being Sylvanas. <laughs> you pretty much lose. Uh, so you got a brawl. Hopefully the Sylvanas doesn't come out of it. Um, Azure Drake would be a pretty bad target as well. Oh, yikes. Ouch. Worst case scenario. So bad. Yeah, far. that's really, really bad. Now it, it, it gets rid of the, the chance of him using Ragnaros next turn as well as maybe a comeback mechanic and Force of Nature off the top. And uh, 14 plus 7, Innervate Hero Power, plus 8, 22. He does have it. Okay. That is going to be lethal. So hyped. Wow. After a pretty grueling game, long grueling game, it's going to take uh, the first series. And um, again, the first game of the series in the last two matches has been longer than our fir whole first series of the day. <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty interesting game, actually. Really, really interesting to see. And a little bit of flash there from hype to the end oh, of the time yeah. of Winder. I can whatever that, that those guys go. Whatever that dark colored juice is in his cup. How, how deep did those guys go in their deck? That must be a lot of cards drawn. Mm -hmm. Probably ten cards um, left, I think, for both players. Yeah, that was a, a really interesting back and forth game. Wasn't really sure where that was gonna go for a little while. But uh hyped able to get the win and go to one and oh with his druid combo. And he's gonna move on to one of his other decks, which is either gonna be rogue or mage. Now those are pretty good matchups for the warrior i guess if you're Frazar. so i think if you're Frazar, unless it's mech mage uh, which can actually which can be a really bad matchup for control warrior as as someone who's played a thousand two thousand games of control warrior you'll know tj that when you run into a, a coin turn one snow chugger you you and you don't draw your fire war x it's the worst thing in the world yeah sometimes i just get up and leave my computer no, I would never do that, not BM. I usually play it out, but it is really frustrating. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, if it is Freeze Mage, uh, then it's really rough. Really good. Yeah, but it, it looks like the uh, the next matchup is going to be... Uh, Fresno's actually going to switch. He's going yeah, to go to Hunter. Yeah, he's going to go to Hunter. Which is a really go good read. Rogue. Yeah, it's a really good read because Hyped is going to go with Rogue. And uh, he makes the read that Hyped most likely uh, is saving that Mage for last. And actually, Hunter and Warrior are both good against Freeze Mage and um, if it's Freeze Mage and Rogue. So it could be, even though Hype did win the first series, he is going to have trouble getting through that warrior, most likely, unless he brought Mech Mage. So. Well, we will see what Hype does decide to bring. Hype is a kind of a master of the Rogue class. Um, he's very, very competent on Mage as well. It does make a lot of new archetypes on Mage. Uh, we remember the Giant's Mage from a while back was a a creation of heights but he is rogue is probably one of his strongest classes uh the mech rogue was one of it, another of his innovations around the time that gvg came out it's kind of fallen off a little bit so obviously oil rogue is very strong but uh we're looking forward to seeing what hyped has brought for us in this rogue deck and, and how he goes about playing it he was one of the pioneers of of miracle rogue back in the day um temple storm in general hyped and used to be wreckful uh, yeah. Before, before we just got flashed by a unicorn again. Um, they don't believe us. 
They don't believe us that we're getting flashed by a unicorn, but it is happening. I promise. Yeah. The casters are high on competitive Hearthstone right now. It's true. That's what it is. Uh, but yeah, Hyped and, and Wreckful were two of the strongest Miracle Rope players back in the day, and they were both picked up by Temple Storm, but uh, Wreckful ended up taking a big hiatus, switch games, and now is not really a competitive player anymore. He mostly plays like Arena or yeah. uh, casually ranked. So um, looks like we are uh, into the match, and Dr. Boom is actually uh, argued upon a lot among high-level Oil Rope players, whether or not it's, it's good in in the deck and it's kind of tough isn't it because it's well it is, is it good in this deck but it is just good yeah it's it is really just good but it's also very slow and a lot of times since rogues already run they're such a tempo based deck they rely on being able to clear the board early and then draw into a large burst of damage if they get caught with a clunky hand early on sometimes they can just lose because one of the main weaknesses of rogue is that they succumb really easily to pressure that's why c classes like uh, Hunter are really strong against them or mid-range druid are really strong against them sometimes because if they can put on a lot of pressure Then the rogue just doesn't have time to clear the board plus play their own threats and uh, Before they know it, they lose so uh, if you get caught with a bad hand early on as rogue Like if you get like double sprint dr. Boom in your opening hand that feels really bad So you'll see some rogue players cut a sprint uh, or some rogue players just say you know what screw it double sprint and dr. Boom and this is a pretty good hand, I think, for, for Hyped early on. It's, it's got a lot of flexibility. We see the face hunter for Fraser, pretty obviously. Uh, Funny Wolf Rider, Glaive Zuka, did see an explosive trap earlier in his mulligan as well. So uh, he's going to be looking at what he can do here. But actually, this, I don't, I don't know how you feel with this match of TJ. I often think it's it can be really good for the rogue because of things like Fan of Knives things like backstab the ability to use the hero power dagger to kill off these one health minions but actually when you're particularly when you're using the dagger you can often be doing a little bit of the face hunters work for them and taking that damage onto your face and you can you can sometimes find yourself in a position where you're caught on very low health and suddenly things start snowballing but it feels like it's probably an okay matchup for the rogue uh, i don't know i think this is one of the hardest matchups for rogue um the only way you can win in this matchup, or one of the only ways you can win, is one, if the hunter draws terribly and you draw amazingly, or two, you race them. It's really hard to race a face hunter. And like you said, a lot of times, rogue spells are just reactive. So what is a face hunter doing every turn? He's doing damage to the face. And then what is a rogue doing every turn? He's removing what has already done damage to his face, sometimes by taking more damage to his face. So it... It just everything works against the rogue in this matchup and by the time they get enough they build up enough threats to um, get themselves back in the game it's already too late and so uh, th it's just really rough he doesn't have oils having early oils or early prep oils big weapon buffs early on in the game is one of the ways you can win because you can race with big daggers and like huge blade flurry plays um, but right now he just I guess next turn he can coin out an Azure Drake and, and actually take a body on the board. And he does have a lot of burn, but it's going to be really tough. Yeah, and those weapons are really difficult to deal with as well because Rogue's not necessarily running anything like Harrison and things like that. And, uh, you know, he can, they can, the Rogue can probably remove everything the Hunter puts on the board, but can't do anything about those weapons. Can't stop that damage coming in. And yeah. the little dagger is a little bit less of a punch than the, the bow. <laughs> Yeah. It's actually low theb in, in the face hunter for, for Frazar here. It's yeah. very rare you see a face hunter with minions that cost more than three mana. Uh, it's actually a pretty surprising inclusion, and I guess... I love it. It's to, it's to protect himself and, and be able to establish board against classes which can clear him so well. Exactly. A lot of the classes that struggle against hunter already are classes that rely on spells to remove, and this locks him out of a whole turn. The only thing he can do this turn is Blood Mage and Dagger. Uh, the best turn, I think, here is actually to backstab and then trade in. And that's terrible. He's pretty much using a whole <laughs> turn just to clear up the Lothep. It, it's either that or he takes five damage. So backstab is... Five mana backstab is the only way. Five mana deal three damage. 
It never feels way. good when you have to play a spell when your opponent plays Lothab. But sometimes you're just in this position where, oh, particularly no. against Rogue. Okay, well, he's got to go face here. If he trades, I'll be very surprised. He, the only way he can win here is if he races. And yeah, he's going to try and race. And actually, next turn, you look at it, he can um, Deadly Poison, Eviscerate, Eviscerate with spell damage on the board, um, and then prep Tinker Sword Oil. Okay, hold on. What, what would be the best way to do? He'll have six mana, so he can prep Tinker Sword Oil, Deadly Poison. That's two mana. Eviscerate Blade Flurry, which would be, oh man, if nothing on the board is cleared, six plus six, that's 12, plus five, that's 17, plus, yeah, he's, I think he has lethal next turn, to be honest. The double spell power as well. If nothing is cleared off the board, I think <laughs> Hyped wins. Okay. I'm just going to take your word for it on the maths because I'm trying to watch what's going on rather than count all those crazy cards. But it looks like Fraser is just going face here, putting his opponent low, and if he is the face hunter. That is his job. I... And uh... Okay, prep, tinker. Um, deadly poison. He's doing the math right now. You can see in the, he's talking to himself. Six plus six is 12, plus two is 14, plus five is nine. That's lethal. Yeah, that's game. Oh my God. See, that's the only way that rogues can win is if they race. And sometimes rogues can race really damn well. And that's <laughs> one of the cases right there. And yeah, that's just, whew. Let's look at, let's look that's at Fraser's face as he sees this. He's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Hyped once again, takes a sip casually. <laughs> nice. Well, that's going to be a 2 0 lead for Hype. That's a pretty huge win uh, against the Face Hunter. And he does have the Mage left now. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what variant of Mage Hype has brought, whether it's something completely new or the, the Mega Mage or the Freeze Mage. And I guess we'll see that in just a second. But that's that's a tough loss to take for for Frazar. and it, it's gonna be he's gonna switch back to his warrior, I guess, perhaps anticipating a freeze mage, yeah, uh, which is pretty smart. But if it's mech mage, this could be the end. Yeah, um, I guess if it's mech mage, it's over anyway. If, even if you don't pick warrior, really? Yeah, warrior is just sort of a way. He has to. He just has to. If it's freeze mage, then he needs to take the win with warrior. Um, but he actually does have a pretty good lineup against Freeze Mage. Face Hunter does pretty well against Freeze Mage. Uh, Warrior, the hardest counter to Freeze Mage. Warrior versus Freeze Mage is one of the most lopsided matchups. Yeah. It's probably 90 10 in favor of the Freeze Mage. Or, sorry, in favor of the Warrior. <sighs> Big mistake there. In favor of the Warrior, which is one of the most lopsided matchups. And uh, there was a, uh, I think, um, C Story Cup uh, Ignite won a game against yeah. Warrior's Freeze Mage. You have to have insane draws. You have to get a lot of value out of Archmage Antonidas or, like I said, insane draws. It's just really tough, but we'll have to see. Still don't know what variation of Mage is, is from Hype because we have not seen it yet, but really interested to see actually what it is. Absolutely. The Priest, though, as well, is, is a pretty interesting matchup if this is Freeze Mage because if you're getting bursted down and you can heal yourself up with your Priest, it, it could be pretty huge. And something like a, a mind control on an Alex Straza, that can be a that can be a pretty insane tempo swing. Yeah, but I mean, priests are. There's two ways that you can beat a freeze mage: is overwhelming amounts of uh, health gain, or pressure. And priest doesn't have either of those. Priests don't have overwhelming amounts of health gain because. They usually don't run like anti kill bot. Like the only the only method that they have a burst heal is like a holy fire, which some priests don't even run anymore. And so once they get Alex Straza, they're pretty much dead because they never put on enough pressure earlier on. Um, and it looks like it is freeze mage. So yeah. So we see the flame strike, the cone of cold, and the Thoris, and we saw the impact of Thoris on freeze mage earlier on. My oh my, dog used that to great effect. Um, it's what does the warrior need to draw here in this matchup? Obviously, it's a really good matchup for the warrior. Nothing. Does it matter? <laughs> it doesn't. The only thing that matters in this matchup is the mage's draws. The mage has to have perfect draws, and the warrior just has to armor up. That's effectively what it is. Uh, the warrior, you want to like hold on to your armor smiths later in the game so you can make like big armor swing turns. Um, 
like you want to be able to use your armor smith with a couple creatures on the board and coupled with a death bite whirlwind effect uh but it, warrior doesn't even have to put pressure on because they can put pressure on uh but they can really just armor up and that's exactly what he's going to do a lot of times you'll see freeze mages one of the ways that you can win is by keeping the armor count low um like in, instead of a turn where you would normally like maybe play a loot hoarder and then ping and le float like four mana you would do the same thing, but you would use one of your early fireballs to chip off some of the armor. So that way, you put yourself in a position where if you if you get Alex Straza out, you can find a way to win. It's one of the only ways you'll win by doing this that. This is such a fast match so far, these guys. Because they know, they so know. Quickly. It's inevitable. The, the match is always inevitable because it's it's really just one player playing. It's the freeze mage playing, and the warrior's just like, eh, armor up. What do you think about not playing the armor smith? Fraser had a couple of opportunities to play that armor smith and decided not to. Oh well, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. You, you can't just throw out the armor smith willy nilly because that's one of your main. Um, it's like a GG button later on. If you can get four creatures on the board with a despite whirlwind, throw down your your armor smith. You don't want to throw it out there because if it gets armor frost bolted and and pinged. Throwing away your armor smith is one of the ways that you can lose as the warrior. So you want to make sure that you're using it later on, when you can, when you have a lot of creatures on board, um, or when you can play it and gain armor this, with it the same turn, like with those death bite combinations. So, I mean, I, I say you just armor up every turn, but you still can't just do whatever you want in this matchup. Yeah, we're gonna see a turn, a turn six Doctor Boom, and even if this wasn't a highly favored matchup, a turn six Doctor Boom feels pretty good. One of the strongest plays that you can make. Pretty much. In the game. Well, there's a Frost Nova. Double Frost Nova in hand, but no uh, Doomsayer. There's the Malganus, which we talked about. Uh, not the Malganus, sorry. The Malagos uh, that we talked about earlier on. This, I think this is one of the strongest variations. It's it's uh, dependent on combo. You... you pretty much hard mulligan for Emperor Thorsan because if you don't have it, the Malagos is pretty useless unless you know it's going to survive for a turn. Um, so he needs to draw into Emperor Thorsan to make that combo useful. But there are some cards in Ma Freeze Mage that you can sacrifice. Um, it's it's tough, but sometimes you can run like one flame strike instead of two flame strikes and put in Malagos as just sort of an extra win condition. An extra opportunity for a win condition so you're not sacrificing too much by going with the malagos version uh but the malagos version is dependent on you drawing emperor thor's hand to make those combos available like to make the malagos double frostbolt double ice lance combination a thing all right so we're going to see the armor smith here it's a pretty strong play when you play the armor smith and the accolade together mm -hmm. uh especially in the face of something like cone of cold yeah uh which is an that's an interesting pick as well uh i guess Perhaps maybe that's something to do with the Malagos, but Cone of Cold is a card which has been cut from a lot of Freeze Mage. Do you think, uh, I don't know, I, we haven't seen Thor, we didn't see Thorison in his mulligan, so maybe Hype isn't running Thorison. He has to be running Thorison. If you're running Malagos, you're running Thorison. I, I I, mean, I don't see any reason why you would run Malagos and not run Thorison. Um, but yeah, I, I like Cone of Cold. Um, it's just an extra tool for Freeze. Um, and with, with Thorison, it can uh, three... It's basically like a pseudo um, Frost Nova, an extra Frost Nova, an extra insurance. See, this is a big play, and that's what I was talking about. This is what you have to do as the Freeze Mage. In a play, in a turn where you'd otherwise be floating mana, you got to play a Frostbolt or a Fireball to chip off the armor. And uh, playing the Armor Smith on a board with uh, multiple creatures is a pretty big deal because it makes it so he can't use cards like Blizzard. He can't use Blizzard. He can't use Cone of Cold because. You're freezing him and you're buying yourself time, but you're also just giving him armor. So here, I think we're going to see... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a Death Bite developed. So that way, he sort of forces the mage into position where he has to take the armor smith off the board or risk just ridiculous amounts of pressure being put on. Low with them sort of serves the same purpose. It buys time, preserves your armor smith. So it's looking really, really rough for... Actually, maybe not so much. Because the armor count is really low. He's going to go for the Alexstrasza. 
think that might have been. I would have liked to see Despite develop that turn and save the Lothan for after the Alexstrasza. Because if he, what he, if he had developed the Despite last turn and hit face with it, this turn he could have Lothabbed, hit face with the Despite, gained four armor from that, and been able to execute. Yeah. On no, the same turn and armor up. So yeah. that might have been a little bit of misplay. And he's actually at a pretty low armor count right now. And he doesn't have a really easy way to proc the execute. He has to like throw his Acolyte of Pain in, which reduces the amount of armor that he'll gain from Despite. I think that might have been a slight misplay by not developing the Despite the previous turn, but we'll have to see. Well, as you said, you're you're an experienced warrior player, so I'll uh, I'll take your word for it. As having logged multiple thousands <laughs> of games, but he is gonna, yeah, he's gonna use the Acolyte of Pain to trigger that execute, and that definitely doesn't feel as optimal as using the the Despite Whirlwind. Doesn't get as much armor as you said, so I think you are probably right. Um, Despite, he's got to play Despite. Here. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. Because you can just put on pressure here. Uh, I mean, this I don't is think, true. Is there an ice block up? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, we can't quite see the secrets on the overlay. Obviously, we'll see it when it flips back around. But I don't think there is actually a secret up. So I think unless ice block comes in this turn, it's probably done. Yeah. Because, I mean, oh, okay. So there is an ice block. An ice block has just been popped thanks okay. to the cool Taskmaster. Yeah, I was going to say. So even if the board gets cleared here, Ragnaros is lethal. Um, does he have enough damage? Uh, I don't think so. Blood uh, Mage, Fireball, Frostbolt, yeah. Frostbolt. No, it's not enough. Let's go on 7, 5, 12, 4, 16. No, it's not enough. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's no way that... He, well, no, he can Frost Nova and then Frostbolt face. Uh, which will block any damage from coming from the board or from the hand. Um, Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ice Lance will put him at uh, 10. If he doesn't take this armor off here, he's dead because the Shield Slam on the Thalnos and then the Ragnaros is lethal. So he needs to take this armor off with the Frostbolt. Yeah. Uh, and then he's actually... No, no, no. I, think, I don't think there's any way to win. There's an Armorsmith on the board. So all he has to do is... Oh no, he can't proc it! Wow. He's actually on a fireball draw to win. <laughs> Unless right Ragn... Well, I guess you pretty much just have to Ragnaros here and go for the 50-50. Yeah, right? and hope for the 50-50, yeah. Well, that's 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 how you win here. As oh no, 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 he's used, he's used a second fireball, that's right. He used it to chip off armor, so just kidding. Uh, I think the game's over. <laughs> I don't think there's any damage that he can draw into that's going to win him the game. He has to draw into Ice Block. Um, he has to draw into Ice Block, and then... Okay, he has to win the Rag 50-50. Then he has to draw into Ice Block this turn. Fireball face. Then draw into um, Pyroblast the next turn. Okay, yeah. And in between... Actually, next turn, he has to draw into Arcane Intellect. And with that Arcane Intellect, he has to draw into Ice Lance <laughs> to freeze his face so he can't get Death's Bite procced on all his minions to gain all that armor. And then he has to draw into Pyroblast. Sure. That's okay. That's what Very you're unlikely. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> there is. There is a chance. Okay. Well, let's see if Ragnaros just puts this game to an end right now. Mm -hmm. It's 50 50 for the win. No. There we go. Okay. So Fraser is going to take that game. He's going to go up to 2 1. It's going to be 2 1 here for Hyped. He's going to get two more shots to win with that Freeze Mage. Mm hmm. And um, so, Face Hunter, he's, uh, Frezar has Face Hunter left and Priest left. So, I'd imagine you go with Face Hunter next just because you might as well try and bring it to, to a game five. I know he knows that he has to win with Priest eventually, but Face Hunter is the obvious uh, deck choice if you're trying to get the immediate win. And Correct. it looks like, yeah, he does, it looks like he is going to choose, choose Hunter. So, this is actually a pretty good matchup for Hunter. So, this. The series could end up going to game five. It's very real. Could not being priest versus freeze mage could be our finale. Oh yes. <laughs> I just said I think that's a, a pretty good matchup for the mage. The priest could, ne could possibly have some have some options in that matchup, but it's probably a pretty good one for the mage. So hyped is in a pretty good position here because he knows that he has a pretty good matchup against the priest, even if he loses to the face answer. Yeah. 
there's there are also those changes that may that freeze mage can be uh, freeze hunter. You have to uh, stall a lot of time with ice barriers early on. Um, having early creatures like loot hoarder to be able to to match with the next creature that comes out is a pretty big deal. But it is hard because you by the time you get to a turn where you normally like Alex Straza, uh, you're already in a situation where you're probably going to be really low health, playing very defensively. And so there's not really going to be a turn where you can play Alex Straza and not do anything defensive and then be able to kill him the next turn as well. So it's just really, really, really tough matchup. Yeah, it is pretty tough, but we're going to see this matchup getting into it now just very quickly. Uh, we've seen these decks before, obviously. We've seen the face hunter already uh, in game number two. And that came down to a very close catch up with the free, with the face hunter and the rogue. And that would have been a, a match that Fraser was hoping to win, but yeah that priest the priest choice in the lineup i'm really not sure how i feel about it to be honest i think it is uh it's a little bit tough it's got a lot of weak matchups right now a lot of popular decks or decks that are popular right now um are strong against it oil rogue popular strong uh freeze mage popular really strong against priest um i guess he might have been expecting a lot more face hunters in which case, priest would have been a good, a good, uh, good choice. Mad scientist is a definite keep in this situation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to keep the burn though. It's tough. Yeah, it's it's tough because, what are you going to do if, you, if you use your burst early to to take out the threats? What are you then going to win with? Yeah. All right, he keeps Frostbolt, which I like. It's sort of an emergency. And he actually threw away the man. Oh, no, no, he got, okay, he has both man scientists. That's a pretty good early hand with the exception of that ice block being in there. I guess it gives him sort of that manual ice block that he can use later on after the first one comes from the man scientist. Let me see that that uh, Maligos in hand early. Early ice block as well, which could be important for hyped, but it's kind of unfortunate he gets the double mad scientist with the, the ice block in hand, and he's probably gonna, yeah, he's gonna coin ping to kill this leper gnome. That never like, feels good. Yeah, but I like that play. That leper gnome's gonna do two damage regardless. Um, just this way, you're you're hoping that your mad scientist is gonna trade for something a little better. And you stop, and yeah, and you stop follow up plays with abusive sergeant or glaive zuka, which could be really devastating. So yeah, I I do think it's the right play. I just think it's. It never feels good to coin out your hero power, full stop. But it's a, a pretty solid heads up play from Hyped. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking about Mad, Mad Scientist versus Ping again, just to clear up this 2 1. Pinging would, it would actually be pretty good here, if, unless Fraser draws into something like an animal companion. Uh, if he pings off this abusive sergeant, there's really nothing to follow up. Yeah, he plays around. Uh, like a stronger glyph you could play or second abuse of such a play like you said earlier yeah, yeah i like that play better of course we have uh caster confirmation bias where we know that there is no turn three play um which would mean that would obviously be the better choice and he he's probably pretty happy about just seeing the hero power on that turn so this play this turn he's going to be able to safely play mad scientist on an empty board knows that it's going to trade with just about anything that comes out and this is actually a pretty weak hand for yeah for um face hunter because unleash the hounds is virtually useless because freeze mages never really flood the board no this is this is really difficult for the face hunter at this point this is such a terrible draw mad scientist is going to come down and we're going to see uh let's see which secret that is mad another mad scientist coming down to the board as well oh and emperor thorsan in hand with malagos so he might not even need Alex Straza. Pilot Shredder is an interesting choice in Face Hunter. We've seen a couple of these mm. in Fraser. He's maybe not. He's not committing to the theme as much as you would expect from a Face Hunter. With things like Lothab and Pilot Shredder, and in this matchup, that's actually probably going to be to his detriment because he can't use those to run in damage. Yeah. It's going to get frost bolted. We'll see what comes out. What's in the box, as you said, and it's uh, three two perfect trade for the Mad Scientist. So. Everything going well for hyped at this point. Yeah, Doomsayer. And he's just gonna, just gonna go with a Doomsayer. <laughs> That's such a great heads up play that 
there's because nothing can come down. The Haunted Creeper is actually a pretty good top deck for Fraser because the that dying doesn't feel that bad. But <laughs> this is a really really interesting play from Hype. It's not something you see very often. Just a uh, a, a Doomsayer getting thrown down on the board, an empty board at the end of a turn. Well, a against the aggro decks, I really like that. Um... Because it's it's virtually becoming uh, sometimes even if you drop it on like a full board without a freeze, it's virtually becoming like a either a silence magnet or a seven health heal. Sometimes even more, at least seven health, because sometimes they can't kill it uh, exactly with seven damage. Now Emperor Thorson coming down, it makes um, Malagos cheaper, which is a huge deal. He wants to get rid of this, but if he's getting rid of that, that's burn damage that he's not using to the face. Because if you like haunted creeper kill commands the emperor. And hero powers here. It's just a lot of burn damage that you're throwing away. Yeah, I mean, he's looking to Leroy here, which I'm not sure I like. I think you need to clear this Thorson, but I don't. Unless he's going to run the Leroy in, he's not. He's just going to go for face. Yeah, and the Leroy doesn't even, basically doesn't even do any damage, just because he has Ice Barrier, so he's still got that two health remaining. Uh, this also makes his Unleash the Hound stronger, which is something that you're not going to really get much out of. That is true. Um, Unless he trade, but he's he's just going to trade the two whelps into the six too, right? I think he just frost overs and then tries to put on damage. I don't know. I think I think you trade. I think you have to be aware of the Unleash the Hounds and you That's trade true. the one ones into the six too. I think when yeah. you see something like that, you have to know he possibly ha does have Unleash the Hounds. Um, so I think, see, from from what we've seen from Hype in terms of just being so heads up, is, uh, yeah, I think that's the way to go. And yeah. and then play Loot Hoarder, Ice Barrier, and, oh, you actually might be thinking about Flame Strike here. I'd be trying to make some use out of Flame Strike. Which, the only reason he would trade into this is if he's planning on using Flame Strike. Or, yeah, Frost Nova as well serves uh, a very similar purpose and uh he doesn't have any burn spells in his hand which he needs with those um with that malagos but i think he's still sitting in a lot better off of, of a position than normally you'd see freeze mage sitting in this at this situation in the game uh against a face hunter so he can't be too upset about where where he is in this game so he's gonna unleash the hounds here and uh, two hounds, probably <laughs> the best value it's ever possible to get against Freeze Mage. And put on the damage while you can. Yeah, definitely. That's what he's going to do. And I think he's going to put the Mad Scientist out here. Just puts more puts more bodies on the board. There is a Flame Strike. And a one mana Ice Block as well. Five mana Flame Strike. One mana ice block. That's uh, that's pretty good. Yep. Um, oh man, this is ridiculous because thinks... he, he's going to get more value from the Emperor Thor's hand now. That Malgos is going to cost four mana after this turn. <laughs> that is absurd, and uh, he's actually going to get the card draw out of this. Um, he. Whoa! Oh, no, he's not. The freezing oh, trap and face hunter. He wasn't Hunch expecting face, it. He did not see that. No, no. You can't always assume. I think wow. it was Fresh Art in the in the Kingwin Pro League that was running the freezing trap. It's becoming more popular in in face hunter because people don't expect it. And against classes like Rogue, like that oil play that we saw earlier, wouldn't have really been possible if the freezing trap was on the board. And that really, oh man, that's that's bad. Because he could have, that the outcome would have been exactly the same. He made a misplay by attacking in with the loot hoarder first, because regardless of what trap that was, the outcome would have been exactly the same. Um, like best case scenario would have happened every time if he had attacked the loot hoarder instead. Now he has to spend eight mana again, playing this Emperor Thorson. That's a it's a pretty tough break there. Yeah, that's or, no good at all. And that does allow Fraser a great window to, uh, to get back into this game. There you go, the six mana Malagos now. There is a juggler unleash, and we'll see, I guess, where those juggles go. 
does have kill command to deal with this Thorison. But at this point, is he gonna try and deal with it? I mean, he's left it alive for this long already. Do you, <laughs> do you even care at this point? He's got four cards. So you you know that you're in a pretty good position. You can't really afford to throw that much damage into the. You have to into the Thorstein. You have to start threatening, popping the block at some point. Yep. So that's what he's gonna do. He's just gonna push this damage in here. He's think he's thinking about it. It's it's a tough choice, but I think you just you you can't even worry about that Thorstein now. Ugh. It is five damage though. So that's one thing that he is accounting for as well. It's not just the effect that he's having. It is the five damage as well. And we'll see where this kill command goes. Uh, he would have kill commanded first if he was planning on um, killing the door sign with it. So, whoa. Well, there's a fireball. That's almost <laughs> lethal. He wins. All he has to do is attack. No, 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 not quite, not quite. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, Arcade Intellect, I think, is a you have to go for. If he draws into any point of damage whatsoever, then Where's he... the Acolyte Pain? Frost Nova stops the block getting popped again. He's actually going to play the uh, the Blood Mage. So. Uh, if nothing comes out here that can deal with what's on the board, it's game over next turn. Because all he has to do is Malgus and Fireball. So, um, I think he might realize this. And if he gets Huffer here, he has to throw it into the Thor Center or else he loses. Yep. Oh, man. It's agonizing because he's so close. Uh, has he done it? And you think back now, he's probably like hating on hating himself because actually, it's the game's still over. Regardless of if he trades or not. Yeah, Malagos Fireball and just the, um, all he needs is just the two damage on the board from what he has. And that's going to do it. Wow, Hyped takes uh, the 3-1 series with the, the Freeze Mage win over Face Hunter. Really impressive stuff. Wow, so Hyped winning 3-1, advancing over Frezar. He's going to the next round. And uh, again, some really interesting games. That first game was uh, the Druid versus the Warrior. That was a really, really great game. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, but yeah, so but we're three games down today. We've got one more match coming up, versus, uh, which is Chucky versus Ekta is going to be our final match of the day. But uh, Hyped Advancing is a player that you kind of picked, I guess, TJ, as, as one to watch, a player that you're a big fan of, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of justified your faith here a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's I, I really like his lineup. Uh, all the matches so far, I thought the player with the better lineup uh, took the victory. So Deck Toys really coming into play here. You could see Frezar's decks just really struggled against what Hype brought, which was well-rounded. Freeze made super strong. I really like that Malagos variation as well. You could tell the power plays that you can make with Thorasan combined with Malagos. So, uh, really great stuff. Congratulations to Hype. Looking forward to seeing him play for the rest of the, for the rest of the tournament. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and we're going to come back with our final match of the day, Chucky versus Ekta. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Kingdom for Charity Easter Edition 2015.